All right, I am here with Alexander Berkurs, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Alexander, we have the Yellow Vest protests in Paris and in France, Act 13. Uh, Act 12 was violent. This one got very, very violent, out of control. Um, RT's Rupley news agency uh, got caught graphic video of what we understand right now was a photographer. He's a photographer, and he photographs the Yellow Vest protests they caught him in the crossfire and a police grenade, for what we know, um, I'm not sure if it is truly confirmed that it was a police grenade, but a police grenade uh, blew, off, blew off his hands. I mean, it was, it was pretty shocking, pretty stunning video, very graphic. Um, things, things got very, very violent. Uh, but I, yeah, but, but co- comment to, to, to the escalation of violence, comment how mainstream media is not reporting on this. Um, obviously, if this was happening in Venezuela, I mean, it would, you know, there would be a U.S. military intervention that minute. Uh, what's going on in Act 13, Alexander? Well, 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 first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's three, there's three things to take away from the Yellow Vest protests. Firstly, they are continuing. All the attempts to suppress them, all the attempts to silence them, Um, have been unsuccessful. People are still coming out and they're still protesting and they're doing so despite the protests or rather the conditions in which the protests are taking place becoming more violent. And you're absolutely right to emphasize the second point because they are becoming more violent. We are seeing a steady escalation. And my own personal view, and this is what I am hearing from people who are um, on the ground in France is that the violence is now definitely coming from the authorities, from the police, and that they are definitely seeking to uh, uh, use violence both to suppress these protests and to discredit them. And very remarkably, the second isn't working. And I think this extremely graphic video that we talked about, and I think it's important to say at this moment that we don't know the exact and full circumstance video there may be something on there we don't know but these this video if it shows nothing else it shows how violent the violence has become in other words we are not talking about just people you know throwing stones at the police and the police uh, hitting people with batons we are seeing people being seriously injured and injured for life so that that is the second thing that's happened And then the third thing that's happened, which is in some ways the most uh, uh, worrying and extraordinary of all, is now that we have what is in effect a media blackout. So um, if you look at the media here in Britain, despite the situation in France getting ever more violent all the time, what we see is that it's not being reported anymore. And um, it's as if these protests in this escalating situation in France, um, it just isn't happening. It's just been completely pushed off the news media. And that is, that is an extremely worrying thing. And as for Macron himself, um, what we see that he's now also trying to do is he's not only doubling down on his policies, but he's trying to assert himself in foreign policy terms and incredibly his latest act of assertion, which failed dismally, was to go against the Germans on Nord Stream 2. A hopeless idea. It, it turned out into a total uh, shambles. But that's what he tried to do. So he's now quarreling with the Italians who support the yellow vests. And he's quarreling with the Germans who up to now have been supporting him. And to my mind, that shows the great extent of the pressure on him. Yeah, the, the media blackout, that's, that's a great point because I, I was trying to figure out if these strikes compared to, uh, to Act 12, if Act 13, if the protesters grew in number or if they decreased. I've heard various accounts. Some, some news agencies said it grew. Some said it was smaller. Some said it was smaller in France but bigger in other cities. So it's even hard to get an accurate uh, idea as to, as to whether these, these protests are gaining momentum, evening out, or decreasing in their, in their momentum. I, I, I think it is impossible to give a figure anymore because of the news blackout. But the point is that they are continuing. And given that they are continuing, as I said, despite the climate of violence, 
And given that the opinion polls still show a continuing uh, support for these protests and growing hostility, or at least continuing hostility to Macron, it is impossible at this moment in time to talk of a loss of momentum. It seems to me that the momentum is still there. And as I said, the pressure on Macron is still there. And that's why, as I said, he's behaving in this very strange way that we are now seeing. And we mentioned Venezuela, Alexander, that if, if, if these protests were happening in Venezuela, the, the United States, the European Union would be up in arms. These protests are resonating globally, though, as well. And, and they do have merit, not only in, in Europe, but, for example, take Mexico. Towards the end of the month, they had the Matamoros strikes, which were around 25,000 workers in Mexico went on strike. And it has a lot of parallels and a lot of commonality to what's happening in France with the yellow vests. So, I mean, the, the, the general feeling all over the world of, of workers upset, uh, you know, angry with the, with the ruling elite, whether it's for wages, whether it's for taxes, uh, for fuel taxes, whatever it may be, it's, it, it really seems to me that it's growing, not only on a not only in France, not only on a European scale, but on a global scale. Absolutely. And can I just make a number of observations about this? Because you're very right to, build, to bring up the Mexican strikes, which have been focused overwhelmingly in the Mexican car industry. Because in my opinion, the parallels between those and what's been happening in France have been extraordinary. First of all, what are these people in Mexico complaining about? They're complaining about very tough working conditions and a clampdown on wages. Why is that happening? It's because the car industry in Mexico is dominated by foreign companies which are squeezing workers in order to extract profits. Again, it's very similar to the anti-globalization protests which is what the Yellow Vest protests ultimately is. In both cases, you see workers in countries in Mexico and in France feeling that they're no longer in a position to get uh, listened to because they are well, operating within a globalized economic environment where the companies they work for and the governments they work for are no longer sovereign, are no longer national. And then the very last thing about the Mexican protests, which is so similar to the one in France, is that there has been almost a total media blackout That's about it. So this this huge strike wave in Mexico, which has taken place, similar grievances, similar issues, similar points made. It's not been reported. Uh, a glo uh, it's not been reported in the global media any more than the, than the yellow vest protests in France are being reported in the global media. And then there is one very last point which I want to make, which is, of course, that once again in Mexico, as in France, what we see is that this is a grassroots protest in Mexico. The institutions that used to once upon a time represent, if you like, in Mexico workers' interests, which is to say the car workers' union, union. Are, supporting, are supporting the companies because they have become fully assimilated in, in the globalized uh, uh, structures which the workers are, in effect, protesting against. So they have created their own grassroots organizations to rebel against those, uh, uh, their own unions, or what used to be their own unions, just as we see the Yellow Wests in France are operating entirely autonomously or independently from the established political parties in France and the established political institutions like the French unions in France, which they no longer feel represent them anymore. Yeah, so they're operating independently. Meanwhile, you have uh, Emperor Macron, who has the cover of the mainstream media. He's afforded the luxury of a complete media blackout. And given that blackout, he can, he can act with, with extreme brutality towards the protesters because he knows he won't face any repercussions for doing that. So, I mean, he can just, he can double down, he can triple down, he can do whatever he wants to the Yellow Vest protesters because he has the luxury of knowing that the entire media 
the establishment neoliberal media won't call them out on it. And even, and, and, and even we're having a hard time figuring out exactly what's happening in Paris, in France. You know, Rupley and RT did get the footage of, of a very violent situation in a violent, in a violent scene. But aside from that, people really don't know what exactly is happening in France with, with the protests. And in Mexico, as you said as well. Exactly. And can I just say, I mean, one of the fundamental problems with all of that is, of course, that you see uh, uh, Rapley and RT reporting this thing leads to attacks on Rapley and RT with, with claims that these protests in France, the yellow vest protests in France, are somehow being orchestrated by the Russians. By the and absurd, the Kremlin, an absurd idea but one which is also being used to discredit the protests. And if we go back to the Mexican uh, 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 car worker strikes, a major strike wave affecting one of Mexico's key export industries, and yet you have to drill down to find alternative media which reported them in any, in any way. And again, the fact that they're not being reported properly is intended to isolate them and to get a very difficult, make it very difficult for outsiders to get a proper handle on what is going on. How, how long is this going to continue? You think now that the do you think the media is going to feel obliged to have to start reporting on what's happening in France, in Paris, with the yellow vests? I, I, I think they can keep it quiet for the moment. I think I think so long as the protests in France continue along the lines uh, at the level that they've been doing up to now um even if they become managed to keep the uh, they will be managed to keep this blockade this media blockade uh, this media blackout going however two things may start may change firstly as i said um spring is coming that tends to lead to bigger protests if the protests start to become much bigger again then of course it becomes very difficult to uh, uh, pretend that they're not happening. And the second thing, of course, is if the protests escalate even further and we start getting, as happens often in France, things like sit-ins, strikes, road blockades, all those sorts of things, which may be, make it very clear, none of us wants to see, but which if the authorities continue to turn a deaf ear to this kind of thing, could very well happen. How, how will the, the dispute between Macron and Italy play out, do you think? Well, that is a very interesting question. I mean, I think that the Italians actually are probably rather pleased that Macron took the step that he did, which is to recall the ambassador, because, of course, what that does is that it again uh, emphasizes to people in Italy, the Italian public, that in fact this is not a uh, integrationist, globalist, neoliberal, uh, uh, pro-EU government, but an anti-one. And given how unpopular Macron is, I think that's, this plays well with people in Italy. And it's very interesting, by the way, to see that the people who invited the Yellow Vests to Italy was not Salvini and the Northern League. It was the Five Star Movement, the left wing the left wing side of the coalition, it seems to me that they're beginning to get restless by the fact that Salvini has been getting all the publicity and all the traction. And this was in a way their attempt to try to sort of uh, um, um, catch up with him. So what we could start to see is that both sides of the Italian coalition um, um, start to compete with each other to see who can be more anti, uh, uh, anti Brussels and anti-Macron, and, well, who knows where that might go. I mean, it, it could very well result in um, Italy starting to make votes, or, uh, you know, in, in the European Council on issues which uh, matter more to the um, EU leadership. We've already seen how e e um, Italy acted to block EU recognition of the Guaido, uh, uh, of Guaido as president of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did that because they particularly care about Guaido. But as I said, I think it was partly intended to assert themselves and to assert Italy uh, as standing up against this combine. And Italy's too big a country to completely ignore. I mean, you know, if, if, if a small country like Hungary 
an Orbant or something like that. Well, they can just say, well, you know, he, you know, Italy's Hungary is a small country. Italy is a big country. I mean, now that Britain is leaving, it is one of the EU three, and of course, it is a founder member of the EU. So they can't just write Italy off. I think where it will become really incendiary is if come uh, May or June, or I think it's June, the Italians come out and say that they're not going. They're going to vote against. Uh, renewal of the Russian sanctions. I'm not saying that's going to happen, right. but it's it's beginning to move in that direction. And if that does happen, especially if the par the EU the elections to the EU Parliament in May bring anti EU parties or, or, or populist parties or whatever they're called uh, uh, to the forefront. If that happens, then, I mean, we are really talking about a big crisis with, at the, in the heart of the European Union. You mentioned Venezuela, Alexander. I want, I want you to comment on that very briefly because we were talking about media blackouts and, and how they're manipulating the narrative. And we did a video on Venezuela the other day and we expressed some concern about whether Maduro is going to be able to, to weather a very, very intense storm, an economic war essentially being waged against him by the United States. But it's also a media war. And, you know, you kind of see the protests, the media, they're reporting on protests, which are pro-Guaido, and, and they're reporting on them a lot. I mean, they're getting a lot of airtime. Meanwhile, anything that's pro-Maduro, you know, you really have to dig it up to, to, to find any sort of images or videos on the pro-Maduro uh, rallies. Well, what do you make of that media? Type well, of black well, well, exactly. And I mean, there's, there, there is, again, I mean, it's clearly that there's a media campaign and it's a, a almost unanimous media campaign now to try to protect, project a certain what's going on in Venezuela. Now, I, I'm going to say this. It's very difficult, again, to get a true and full picture of what is happening in Venezuela. But my impression is, from independent observers who are there, is that the country is actually quite quiet for the moment. There don't seem to have been pro, big pro-Guaido rallies in Venezuela this weekend. It seems to have been reasonably quiet there. The government is still functioning and it still seems to be fully in control. And the civil service and the police are still continuing to obey the government. Now, as we said on our previous video, I'm not sure that's going to last as the economic sanctions bite, especially if the, if the Venezuelan authorities um, have problems refining oil. But for the moment, it doesn't seem as if these Guaido, pro-Guaido protests in Venezuela are particularly large, at least by Venezuelan standards, or that they have ex uh, expanded beyond the usual uh, uh, middle class opposition groups in Venezuela. And it seems that the rest of the population, if it isn't exactly supporting Maduro, is at least uh, 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 um, keeping away from the protests there. Now, that's not the impression that the media is giving. The media is giving a very different impression of a hugely popular movement behind Guaido and of a complete collapse in Maduro's support. That doesn't seem to reflect the actual situation on the ground. But it's very difficult to see. And what I think all this talks, all this shows, you know, our discussion of what's happened in France which, to be clear, is, is extremely important, arguably the most important of these three uh, uh, um, issues. What's happening in Mexico and what's happening in Venezuela is that um, he who controls the narrative, he who controls these, the way these events is reported has a huge advantage. So that if we see a crackdown, a violent crackdown in France, uh, uh, that is not reported. If we see a violent crackdown in Venezuela, uh, that is reported and, and blown, reported. And blown up and exaggerated. And it blown yeah. up and exaggerated. Yeah. If we see big protests in Mexico, that's not reported at all. So, it, 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 in, and we have to be, we who are trying to understand these events, we have to be very, very aware that people are trying to construct narratives and avoid the trap of being controlled by them.
Very well said. Very well said, Alexander McCurris, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much, guys. If you like this video, click the subscribe button down below and click on that notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. Smash that like button as well. Guys, go to the Duran shop, pick up a t-shirt, help support the Duran. In the description box down below, you will find links to our PayPal and Patreon pages. Donate to the Duran. That also helps us out a lot. And of course, you can get a copy of this show in audio format on itunes and soundcloud so follow us there also go to the durant.com and see the articles that alexander mccurris links to every day alexander thank you very much until next time everybody take care